And joining us now, Nick Saul. He is the executive director of the Stop Community Food Center here in Toronto. We're glad you could join us on Thank this you. Thanksgiving Monday. Thanks for having me. First of all, the name, the Stop. Why is it called that? Well, it depends on who you speak with, but our I'm first, to you, Nick. yeah, the first, the first location was uh, 103 Bellevue, and we used to be called Stop 103. We're located in Kensington Market. If you talk to some people, they say it was Stop the Cycle of Poverty, oh. um, and uh, or it could have been St. Stephen's Outreach Project because we started in St. Stephen's in the Field Church, uh, Reverend Cam Russell, back in the mid 70s. Um, and I remember when we made the transition from Stop 103 to the Stop Community Food Center, we got these calls about Stop Bill 103, and we're like, you can send us your money, but we're not stopping the <laughs> education nothing, bill. Nothing new uh, with Bill 103. So we became the Stop Community Food Center. Got it. Well, I remember those days, because I remember covering as a cub reporter some of the Stop 103 activities, mm -hmm. and you are, you are not a food bank anymore, and I want to talk a bit about that transition sure. here. And to that end, here's a piece from the Toronto Star from a couple of months ago. I just want to read an excerpt of, rather than dwelling on the inadequacies of the food bank sector, Mr. Saul, that's you, wants to focus on developing better alternatives. The stop is likewise dependent on such generosity. Roughly 90% of its budget comes from private donors and foundations. But he views his teach a man to fish model as more entrepreneurial, a model that in a way sells itself and which can also be sold. When people, I mean, I've seen you quoted uh, when people say, aren't you just a food bank like everybody else? And that really gets your back up. So what's wrong with the kind of traditional food bank that we all think of? Well, I mean, we started as a food bank back in the 70s. But I think within the DNA of the organization back then, there was a sense that it wasn't good enough just simply to give out food. And I think uh, food bankers generally would say, people who are working in, in food banks would say that uh, Food banks divide us as citizens. Uh, I think they create a moral release valve for government, take them off the hook. And I think uh, the most food insecure people in Canada are people who use food banks. So they're, they're not the answer. Um, and I think we need to raise our voice and say we can do better. And uh, the model that certainly not I've created, a, a, a lot of people have gotten behind this idea of a community food center that does dignified emergency work, does community development food programming like gardens and kitchens and perinatal health. and uh, programs that allow people into the equation to create agency, to create cooks and gardeners and engaged citizens and volunteers, and then underpinned by a real commitment to uh, social justice advocacy and talking about the structural issues that drive people to the food bank in the first place. But I remember when food banks were created, and I think the philosophy behind them was these will be temporary. Once the economy improves, we won't need them anymore. Everybody will be fine. Obviously, yeah. they are, I mean, that was what, 20 years ago, yeah. 25 They've, years ago. They become institutionalized, yeah. and I think that... Uh, you don't like that? No, um, and nor should anyone like that. And I think mm -hmm. anyone who works in the food bank sector would say they're not an answer. And so what we're trying to do, modestly, is to create a different programmatic response, one that does these various things on the food continuum and uses food as a tool to build community, to build health, to build skills, self-esteem, a better environment. And food is a very, very powerful tool to organize in communities. And uh, we didn't foist this on our community. Our community said we need something more. And uh, we've developed something that I think is very transformative. And we think it's a model that has legs across the province. And we've been very excited by uh, meetings with groups in Peterborough and Guelph and all over the province saying, we'd love to know how we can make this community food center idea run in our neighborhood. Now, it won't work exactly the way it works in Davenport West, where we're located. But uh, it, will, it will work elsewhere, and we need to find some support. One of the quotes you mentioned when you read that quote, it talked about our funding formula, 90% mm -hmm. private, 10% government. That's a serious problem. We need to get government into the equation on these food issues. Food needs to be pushed within the public realm. We've left it too long in the marketplace, and that has created diet-related illnesses. It's created environmental problems and clearly hunger. Uh, so it's about time we think about food as a public good that can make a big difference in our communities if we do it right. Well, I guess one of the things you do that's different from food banks is you grow your own, right? We grow a lot of food. Yeah. Uh, we've just opened a new facility at Christian St. Clair called the Green Barn. It's a 10,000 square foot space, a sustainable food production and education center. And it's really a playground for learning about food to increase people's food literacy. So we, uh, we certainly grow a lot of food in our greenhouse there. We have community gardens in between our... But just to be clear, you yeah. give away food for free still yeah. as well, right? That's right. We, uh, we want to make sure that when you come to the food bank that you get enough, uh, that it's nutritious, and that it's as culturally appropriate as possible. We work in a very diverse neighborhood. And that's a problem. This is a struggle in the food bank sector. Do you also provide public speaking training? 
Well, we support our community to find their voice on the issues that matter most to them. So yeah, we support people to take their lived experience and connect those experiences to kind of public policy changes that need to happen. So we've been very active of late on this Do the Math campaign, which is uh, an attempt to raise awareness about the inadequacy of social assistance rates. And we have our community members who are saying very forcefully that social assistance rates are too low. And uh, we've just actually released something, uh, 1,800 respondents who are Do the Math online, uh, online tool, and they say that on average, the income people on social assistance need is about $1,400. And if you, Over what period? Oh, for a month, a month. to live mm -hmm. with some modest dignity and health. And the truth is that if you're on social assistance uh, and a single person, you receive $572 a month. There's an enormous gap there that we need to see changed. Uh, and our community is saying that, and we need mm -hmm. to support our community to say that. Dignity and charity is a, an expression I see a lot yep. from you when I read about your stuff. Sure. Why, why is that so important for you? Well, I mean, charity is something that uh, if you're the giver, it's, it's, it's love, it's altruism. Uh, it's empathy, but if you're the receiver of charity, it often makes you feel smaller and not part of something, and uh, and also stigmatizes you. So, uh, you know, we have a right to food. We, we're signed on on all these charters, the United Nations. We there is a right to food in this country, and the truth is that thousands of people go to bed hungry, and that's not good enough. And so, the work that we do with our community is to raise some noise about that and ensure that our community is there raising the noise and saying, "This is what's going on in my." family, this is what's going on in my community. And I think the Community Food Centre allows that. It's a nurturing hub where people can come together, cook and grow and be active, be involved. They're not passive recipients of charity. That's not what we want to foster in our communities. But most people who do what you do, I think, I think it's fair to say, had some kind of life-altering or eureka moment, if you like, take place in their background. And I think your, yours happened in Africa, didn't it? You're from Africa originally. I was born in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Tanzania. And then you left and then you went back. That's right. And when you went back, something happened that changed your life. What well, was I, it? I grew up in a very progressive household. My, my dad is an Africanist up at, U of, at York University, and my mother was very active on equity and access issues in the, in the school board. Uh, and so I, I come from a family that, uh, that was very committed to social justice. and. Uh, now, interestingly enough, it, it took a trip to back to Africa to live in Mozambique for a year to really w wake me up that you can't take things for granted. And I remember one of my tasks in Africa in Mozambique was to actually line up for food because food was scarce back then in Mozambique. The South Africans were waging a war against Mozambique. And, uh, and so when I came back from that experience, I, I, I did wake up and it, it changed me profoundly. And uh, I feel very lucky to be able to work with colleagues who are committed to uh, creating greater equity in this city, and, and uh, we found a way to you do that through food. One of the things you've also done, which again is different from your typical food bank, is on that table beside you. Yeah. You've written a cookbook. Yeah. <laughs> Good food, Good for, food all. for all. Yeah. What's the message there? Well, firstly, it, it celebrates uh, uh, good, healthy, local, seasonal food. Uh, but if you open it up, uh, it tells our story as an organization mm -hmm. and talks about food as it relates to health and justice and community and the environment. And I think it also screams that food is powerful, you know, food, food matters. And so we're really excited about this. It took a lot of people to pull it off. And what I love about it is when you give it to someone, they go, wow, a nonprofit did this book. And then it does look pretty impressive for, well, yeah, for anybody, let alone yeah. a nonprofit. And then they open it up, they go, ooh, I better get home to, uh, to make that. <laughs> and then they check the back and they say, wow, okay, page 147. And in fact, that recipe is on page 147. So we've done it. We've put it together well, and we're really uh -huh. proud of it, and I hope people go out and buy it. But the key there is that the, the stuff you've got in there is affordable, simple. healthy, yeah. simple, yeah. that anybody can do. That's, yeah. the, that's the drift of it. Absolutely. And it comes out of our kitchens. We spend a lot of time cooking back at our 1884 site at Davenport and Symington and at our new facility, the Green Barn. Uh, we've kind of forgotten how to feed ourselves, and uh, we, need to, we need to grow food, we need to cook for it, cook, cook it, and we need to advocate for good, healthy food. And that comes out, I hope, loud and clear in the book. Well, just in case it doesn't, I'm going to read an excerpt from the yeah. book anyway, okay? Here, here's something. The trouble is, good food doesn't come cheap. Just look at the well-heeled shoppers filling their charts with organic, I don't know how to say this, is that quinoa? Uh, quinoa. Quinoa. Yeah, quinoa. You can tell how often I yeah. shop for this I cooked, kind of stuff. I, I made a quinoa recipe yesterday. Okay, so let's try that again. Filling their carts with organic quinoa yeah. and $10 a pound grapes at Whole Foods. For people on a tight budget, it's tempting to fill that shopping cart with inexpensive, calorie-dense processed foods instead of those packed with nutrients. 
Uh, good food on a small budget, I would think, is hard to do. Is it? Yeah, I think it's tough. Uh, we do have a two-tier food system, for sure. And if you have, uh, if you have money, you're going to eat well, and you're going to come to our farmer's market, and you're going to eat the best food out there. But uh, I think societally, we have a problem that people don't know how to cook. We've forgotten how to cook. So there's no question that if you can cook with whole foods, you can stretch your dollar. But people aren't hungry because they can't cook. People are hungry because they don't have enough income in their pockets to make the decisions they need to make. But I think cooking is something that connects you to food and connects you to community. And we see that ostensibly people to come to our community center to eat. But what we find is around a meal, connections happen. And it's a way for us uh, to build community. And I, I, I referred earlier to the issue of food being trapped by the marketplace. Food is one of those things that you put in your body, it changes you. When you eat it together, it creates commensality and community. Uh, it allows you to express your culture and your background. And if you, if you grow it properly, it can nurture our earth. It's a very powerful thing. And this is why we are pushing for viewing food as a, as a public good. We've left it for too long in the marketplace. Let me follow up on that, because yeah. I guess we've agreed in this country that we're in favor of a single-tier health care system. Yeah. We don't like two-tier health care in this country. Right. Most people don't. Yeah. I've never heard people refer to a single-tier food system, that we've got to get rid of a two-tier food system. What does that even mean? How would you go about doing that? Well, first of all, I mean, I spoke about the Do the Math campaign. We need to increase social assistance rates. 50% of people who use food banks are on social assistance. And my feeling is that most Ontarians have no idea what people on social assistance are living on. And so I hope gone are the days where we think that people who are poor are not budgeting well or making bad choices or as though poverty is a lifestyle choice. Poverty is not a character flaw. People do not have enough income. So we have to increase minimum wages. We have to increase social assistance rates. We've got to build more affordable housing. So there's a lot of things on the public policy side of things that we need to do to allow people into the good food revolution. Because there is a good food revolution led by the middle class, and the work of the stop is to say everyone deserves a spot at that table. And that's our work. And uh, I think we're, we're starting to make, a, make some very powerful changes in our food system. Do you think people are open to that message in the middle of the Great Recession? What? That we have to increase social assistance rates? I, I think it's about priorities, and our, our fellow citizens are, I would say, high on the agenda of, of our of priorities. So, yeah, I think that there's never not a good time to speak about ensuring that folks aren't going to bed hungry, uh, can't buy good food for their kids to take to lunch. Uh, there's, no, there's no other time to talk okay. about it. You've got to be talking about it all the time. Has the demand for your services increased during this Great Recession? Absolutely. A lot? Yeah, about 30% in mm -hmm. our food bank, in our emergency uh, uh, breakfast and lunch programs. We've seen a lot of stress in our neighborhood. Has the charitable spirit of the season uh, increased uh, as well? Yeah, I would say that uh, even though a lot of people are, are not doing so well, that they realize that other people are doing worse. And so for organizations that do very frontline work, um, the community has responded really well and uh, we've appreciated that. And it has been stressful in our center. But uh, we met budget. Our, our year end was, was this past August, and we met budget, and we have another tough year ahead. You've got a big budget, right? What yeah. are you, about two million bucks a year? Yeah, a bit over that. Um, and the new facility, which we just opened, I referred to the Green Barn, has added uh, quite a bit more uh, pressure on us, I should say, from a budgetary mm -hmm. perspective. But it's also given us a platform to tell our story. So when six or 700 people a week come to our farmer's market at Christie and St. Clair at the Green Barn, and uh, access the best food possible. Our trick is to try and convert them into food fighters for equitable access to that good food. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're excited about the new facility. It brings some stress with it, but uh, we see it an enormous, uh, as an enormous opportunity to say everyone needs to access the best food out there. Nick, in our last minute, let me ask you one more thing. Yeah. And this being Thanksgiving, and you do so much work in the charitable field, I'd like to know what you're thankful for on this Thanksgiving. Oh, well, for sure, my family, uh, my sister's family, uh, we're going to have a nice meal on Monday. Um, I'm also thankful for the community that I, that I, I work with, um, who are not embarrassed about their situation and understand that it's not their fault, that, they're, that they are raising their voice and saying uh, things need to change. And so I, I feel like I'm an extraordinarily lucky fellow. I've got a great family and I have a great, great colleagues at, uh, where I work and, and a community that is willing to, to stand up and fight for itself. That's, that's, that's something to be thankful Terrific. for. Nick Saul, Executive Director of the Stop Community Food Center here in Toronto. Thanks for visiting us here at TVO, and happy Thanksgiving to you and yours. 
You too. Thanks. Thanks for having me.